All righty. So uh, recording is going and I'll do the doorbells and stuff. Um, thank you, folks, everybody for joining. My name is Pat Gage and I'm the host of the real, uh, Commercial Real Estate Investing Mastermind. We hold bi-weekly here at, the, at this station and this time. Um, and uh, I, I would like to say thank you very much for everybody who's getting up your evening. I know it's summertime and it's 75 degrees here in Michigan and sunny. So I appreciate you. I know that you won't be disappointed uh, as far as information and knowledge uh, from our guest here, Becca. She's going to inspire us and want to, we're going to be looking at hotels and motels a little bit differently once uh, she gets done, I think, tonight. So uh, the, I'd like to say the mission of this group is to give uh, you the confidence to do your first deal. Um, networking is encouraged in these groups here. Uh, you're going to meet your sponsors, you're going to meet your loan people, you're going to meet your partners on these calls. So please uh, put your information in the chat. And once uh, the uh, call is done, I'll send out the chat log uh, with a link to the recording of this video. So they'll have that as well. But put in the chat log, you know, your name, what you're looking for, what you can help people with, what you're looking for, what you can bring to the table, such like that. Because uh, again, we share that because that's the whole point of these masterminds is getting out and getting and connecting with people um, and doing it that way. So definitely take advantage of that uh, because I will make that available probably by Friday, uh, right? I'm sorry, probably be Saturday by the time I get the recording out because I am gonna out of town on Friday. So, uh, but with that being said, put them in there, get it in there, and then we'll get it to you. And I'll show you at the end how to save the whole chat uh, to your hard drive as well too. So, all righty. Well, we're going to get started here because Becca, my, my guest, the, the person on screen here uh, has been helping investors, giving back, you know, first and foremost is important to her. Um, she's giving a portion of the returns to a charitable foundation. Now she's been in, she's been in real estate for over 10 years. And she's got a, a varied track record. She's got condos. She's done multifamily. She started in residential. Uh, and now she's kind of, well, still multifamily, but kind of a creative twist to it, right? Something that I didn't really think about. And it's kind of in the circles is kind of getting a little bit more popularity uh, of actually taking a hotel, a branded hotel, uh, and, and purchasing it and turning it into multifamily apartments. And I've seen some pictures of, of the, what she shared with me. And I'm like, wow, it's, that's pretty, pretty impressive of, of how they've done it. Now they're just, they haven't finished yet. They're still in their business plan. So, but what she's going to do is she's going to cover how she found it, how the team put together, stuff like that. And then uh, afterwards we'll have time, plenty of time for questions. So please don't worry about that. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over and have you guys don't, you didn't come to hear me talk, so I'm going to turn it over to Becca uh, and have her continue the story and fill in the blanks that I missed out. So welcome, Becca. Thank you well, very much for joining. Thank you, Pat. Thank you for the introduction. And um, thanks so much for inviting me to your meetup. I see some familiar faces and I see some new faces. So um, it will be wonderful to get to know some new people. And I'm delighted to share with you this new creative way of investing. Um, do you want to turn the screen over to me, Pat? I just did because I some, forgot uh, you were supposed to do that. So, yes, the screen is yours. All right. Well. See, this is a person okay, that comes prepared. This is, this is a, a true, like, next class investor, right? She, <laughs> my PowerPoint, my yellow pad sitting next. Look at She's already got... She's already got it all. This is this is this is high tech here. Goodness gracious! <laughs> I, I'm trying to deprogram all that uh, corporate training of the past. So, <laughs> but there's a reason I have a virtual background because there's post-it notes stuck all over my walls. So. Hey, whatever works. <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, again, my name is Becca Hintergart. Um, here's a quick one-two about me. Whoops. Um, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I got a business degree, bachelor's degree in business, and I've spent the majority of my career, about 17 years, at a, as a medical device sales rep. I'm having uh, technical difficulties here. I need my 10-year-old in here to help me. Um, 
As long as you feed them afterwards, that's the, we have to. <laughs> They're hungry already. Um, yeah, so I sold uh, CT scanners for a Fortune 500 company. And um, if any of you have probably had a CT scan in your life, those are large machines. And it was a great job, did very well, worked very hard, did my best, everything that our parents have taught us. But there was an inherent problem in this in that it was not passive at all. I mean, at all. It was the farthest thing from passive. CT scanners are uh, purchased about every seven to 10 years from a hospital. So literally the moment I would close a sale, I would lose my best customer for seven years. Um, so that's quite problematic. Uh, I had two kids and I realized this was not a sustainable life with a three state territory, even though one of them, one of the states was Hawaii and that part was pretty good um, for a sales territory, but the rest, not so much. Then I entered into an age of enlightenment and started reading uh, Red Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, Think Big was a game changer for me. I followed some of the Dave Lindahl for a while with his emerging markets. And I realized I needed to really shape my life into more of a passive income stream rather than hyperactive as it was in medical device sales. Uh, so that's how my journey began. I started out with a, a duplex in San Francisco. This was a, a 110-year-old Victorian building in San Francisco. The only one to bid on it was myself and a contractor. And uh, that should have been a warning sign right there. Um, good old San Francisco, <laughs> especially as I was a single girl and didn't even own a hammer. Um, and good old San Francisco, everything shakes, rattles, and rolls out here. So uh, houses are a little bit crooked. This home was um, moved across the street from eminent domain. The city decided they wanted to build a school. So this duplex was put on a truck, shipped across the street, which made it very difficult to renovate because it was about two inches difference from right to left. So when you're standing in buildings like this, you have to hang your pictures two inches crooked on one side to have it straight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, yeah. It, you guys have got all the cool things. Oh, it's just crazy as can be. Um, that was a great project, though. A lot learned there. And that was my proof statement of passive income. I, uh, that was a house hack, so I lived in one unit, renovated the upstairs, then lived downstairs, and vice versa. Then I went on and got a 12-unit in Kansas City. This was a good deal, bought on a short sale. This was somewhat of a speculation play. Um, it was good while it was good, and I learned quite a bit in, in that property. A lot was learned there. Essentially, just because you hired a manager doesn't mean it's going to go smoothly. You must manage the manager. Um, as a speculation play, I believed in this area. It was one block away from a, a great area. One block, the path of progress only needed to move. I was on a, a women's um, call in a, a women's real estate investing meetup, and one of the gals is bidding on my property that I owned in Kansas City. And it is four times the price of what I paid. Oh, so yeah. my, <laughs> my speculative play was... In my one to five years of hold, it would go up, but it happened in the five to 10 year after I, I got rid of it. So speculation is a timing game there. Um, and I, I'm still a passive investor in 149 unit in Longview, Texas. But the most interesting project, which you all want to hear about and are here to hear about, is the 100 unit quality in motel to multifamily conversion in Sierra Vista, Arizona see some Arizona folks on this call too. Looking at you, Alicia. Nice to see you. <laughs> so a few things to talk about today, folks. Why a hotel conversion? Why now? Why would you want to do that? Uh, how would you identify an opportunity like that? I'll give you a case study, which is ours, and we'll open it up for Q&A. Pat, would you prefer everybody saves their questions for the end, did you say? Yeah, let's try that. Uh, or would you prefer some, conversation? I don't want to interrupt your flow, um, but that would be great. Okay. 
Okay, great. That's just fine. Just let me know if it seems like I'm talking to myself sometimes, you know. Um, but uh, that's a good idea because a lot of the questions are are addressed through the presentation that you would have during I'm sure the are. This looks like I said, so this is very professional. This is... <laughs> you set the bar too high here, Becca. That, that they're going to expect this every week now. This is. Don't be fooled. I'm wearing my bunny slippers, Pat. Okay, there you go. There <laughs> and you it's go. chaos behind me with hungry children. <laughs> Don't give me too much credit. <laughs> well, folks, the hotel apocalypse is here. By the end of 2021, 35% of small hotels and motels will be in financial distress. On top of this, those that follow this industry um, estimate values to go down another 20 to 30% by the end of the year. It will vary on the brand, it will vary on the market, and the asset type. But this is something to watch. The opportunity is certainly now. Lodging fundamentals. Um, go for about a five and a half year cycle. So we have three years left on that, which puts us to what, 2024. These opportunities will still be available. Can I, I, I let me clarify, what, what does that mean, I guess, when you said that? That means the cycle of when they think things will rebound again in the hotel sector. There, there's and a tip, tip. for saying five years or three more years from today. Three more years from today, because this area has been hemorrhaging for a while. Airbnb has knocked a lot of hotels on their side, Airbnb oh. and VRBO. Okay. It's been stressing for a while. And COVID has just tanked this industry. Not entirely, not all brands, but many. Things like your Days In, your Quality In, your Motel Sixes. Other brands have deeper pockets, like your West Inn and some of the other large hotels. But the, major the large majority of small hotel motels are family-owned, mom and pops, and they just don't have the deep pockets to withstand this, the vacancies in this pandemic. Thank you for clarifying. You betcha. Thanks for asking. Well, many options for re repurposing hotels, and this is what I like, things really get fun here. Um, this is not your, your run-of-the-mill multifamily play here. So many things you can do with hotels. Um, one of them, workforce housing. You can acquire hotels for a fraction of the price that you would a multifamily. Granted, they're heavy lifts, and we'll go into that. But um, you can acquire these for less than replacement cost in most cases. So a workforce housing play is a very good one for these. Also, um, affordable housing, new construction, as we all know, when builders build, they build A-class properties and uh, to get the most bang for their buck. So there's a, a definite need for affordable housing. Senior housing, I've seen several hotels do the, the senior housing play, and we have a lot of baby boomers that are downsizing. And the uh, senior housing market has, has a lot of high demand. There's a number of hotels turned into senior housing that I have seen. And then they're perfectly set up for it, if you think about it, because they have the downstairs eating area. You know, that kind of uh, area where you check in, and they often have a little brunch area, which is perfect for the seniors. Low-income housing is another play on this for crowded cities that ha lack low-income housing. Homeless shelters here in the Bay Area, San Francisco and Oakland, just turned two or th two to three hotels, I think the third one's in the process, to homeless shelters. There's uh, also the play of Schwanky Studios in downtown Austin. There's a company called New NU that's out there. It's a huge company, big pockets, these big players, these guys but they've turned the hotels into schwanky studios for millennials in downtown Austin. So lots and lots of things you can do. There's also value plays here that are not available in certain markets. Okay, so hear me out on this one. Um, 
For those of you that are in expensive cities and rent control markets, like uh, New York City, there's five rent control states currently, right? San Francisco, or, um, California, Oregon, Maryland, New York, New Jersey. In these markets, um, how rent control works in San Francisco, or, or rather California, for example, you can, you, the, the, the state sets the bar, which is 5%. Then you can increase the rent based on the consumer price index of that county. So where I'm at, you can increase the rent 9%. So 5% plus the four consumer price index. Statewide, 10% is the max. So that's not bad because you underwrite multifamilies at 3% rent increase. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Except the problem is you inherit tenants at a very low price, at a very low rent. You can have tenants in some of these um, rent control markets that are in two bedroom apartments that should be $4,000 a month, but instead are 1,000. So if you can only raise the rent 10% on them, it's gonna take you a lifetime to even catch up, be at the market price. Gotcha. This is the challenge of cities, certain very oppressive rent control cities like San Francisco, you can only raise the rent about 2% doesn't even index with inflation. It's, it's one of the most suffocating rent control cities uh, probably in the nation. Well, so multifamily in, in a lot of these places, you think, well, why, why would you bother? But because of hotels, these are 30-day leases. So they're not subject to rent control. So you can get a hotel in San Francisco entirely vacant, bring it up uh, by doing all your value add, bring it up to market rents and, and sell it in a market where multifamily uh, apartments that are at market rents are very high in demand and would, would you get a premium dollar. So it's just a different spin. I only think this way because here I am in the Bay Area and um, that's something that you need to consider. But hotels fit perfectly within this. Also, um, certain cities, the Bay Area in particular, they've realized the housing crisis they have, so they have loosened some of the zoning restrictions. And that's a big pitfall, and that's what we'll get into in, in some of these slides, something to really think about. But, I mean, just look at these hotels. There's all different. These are just a few things, but really open your mind to the possibilities of what this, where you could, um, where you could place these. All right. So. <laughs> that might be more than you wanted to know, but. No, that's okay. Um, so finding opportunity, where do you find these? Finding opportunity, solving a problem. Here's a, here's a picture of our deal. This was a quality in motel currently at 30% occupancy. Mom and pop owners, they could cover the cost of operations, but they couldn't cover the debt service. They could cover one or the other, but they couldn't cover both. Additionally, with hotels, you have the cost of the franchise. So this was a quality in Choice Hotels is the franchise owner. They had to pay uh, annual fees to Choice Hotels. So that wasn't, that, they certainly didn't have enough money for that. The demand in this market, there's a lack of rental inventory under $1,000 a month. Definitely, these units are needed. Our target rent is in the eights, the low eights. Local rents do not support the cost of construction whatsoever. Um, as we said, when builders build, they build A-class construction or B-plus. They're not messing around with C-class construction like this. So it solves a problem for the uh, hotel owners and opportunity for us. Gotcha. It looks like a nice, nice area, too. I mean, Yeah, this is considered a B-class asset in Sierra Vista. This is uh, Sierra Vista's uh, about an hour outside of Tucson or so, 40 minutes to an hour. What it is, it's a 100-unit quality in motel. We're taking down to 65 multifamily units, 31 one-bedrooms, 31 studios, and three two-bedrooms. And I'll show you in future slides how we do this. Purchase price, one seven and some change. Rehab cost, one seven. Oh, pretty hairy has heavy lift all over it. 
I don't think when we do our due diligence, we put that much in for rehab. It's, I guess some people can, so. <laughs> well, we're one step away from taking a bulldozer to this place, so. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Heavy lift it is. Our rehab timeline's about six to eight months. Projected IRR, pretty close to 18. Equity multiple, 2.42. We wow. like these numbers. Yes. yes. Nice. There's, there's lots of room in these deals. There, there's lots of meat on the bone. They're not for the faint of heart by any means. And an experienced GP is a must. But there's, there's tremendous uh, meat on the bone, which we love. All right. Here's the game plan. Exterior improvements, as you saw, it needed paint. Uh, landscaping, signage. Have a look at this sign. We're loving this. We're having so much fun with this sign. This is the, the great thing with hotels. You, you inherit this massive sign. So, you know, you have a vacancy and everybody within a quarter mile will know that you have a unit available. And, uh, well, your tenants will always find their way home at night. <laughs> it's pretty now, large. That was, that was a question I had because I know you had talked about this earlier like the zoning and stuff. So the city didn't make you, cause it's, it's really a hotel. So if you were going to build an apartment, they, their signage laws, like, so you're grandfathered in to their signage, right? You are, you that are awesome. to a, to a certain is, size. Yeah. <laughs> but in hotels, you inherit their gigantic sign that was permitted for hotels. Wow. That's, that's worth some of the price right there, not the one seven, but close. <laughs> I know. Yeah, this is a mock-up of what we're going to do. We've been having a lot of fun with this sign. Uh, pool renovation is needed. Pretty much need to do the whole pool. HVAC, we're keeping some of the units. Many of them need to be replaced. Doors, I'll get into that. The doors are fun in hotels. You sort of do a door shuffle. Some You take away some doors, you put in some doors. Uh, windows are needed. This one, this is pretty interesting. This is, um, you know, in hotels, the second level of the hotel windows don't open up. So we've had to budget to replace all of those windows to opening windows. I guess it was a safety precaution so people don't jump out of windows in hotels. But it's required um, replacing all of those windows. So we, we knew that. That was, that was in the budget. Interior improvements, electric. So here's, I'll, I'll get into some of these in, in the pitfalls, but this is a big thing to underwrite for. Um, when hotel rooms, they have sufficient electric for your lampshade and your clock, but they don't have sufficient electric for a kitchenette. So we have had to um, spend about 130 in electrical upgrades to add the kitchenette. Something something to think about as you look at these because probably in almost all cases you would find that unless you were buying a hotel that was a suite that had a kitchen which is a very good play for those looking at hotels because a lot of the work's done for you there plumbing big cost in plumbing here major in fact um Plumbing and fire safety, these two go together. We have had to run a dedicated line of plumbing for fire sprinklers to run in all of the units. It's a cost of about 180 to 190,000. So that's a big one to think about. You will almost always have to put that in and it will be very pricey. Um, combining, converting units, I'll show you a, the diagram of how this works out because I know everybody thinks, well, how do you even do that? I can't even get my head around that. Um, I'll show you how that's done. Adding kitchenettes, what we're doing here also to save costs since so many of these are small units, 31 one-bedrooms, 31 studios. Instead of putting in a full range, we've added these, these, um, these ovens that are, uh, can bake, can broil, and can convect. So we've saved a lot in just the features for the kitchen and a lot in space also. And they have all the same functions. On this deal, we'll be implementing rubs as is typical for our comparable properties in the surrounding area. All right, folks, here it is. This is what you're wondering. How the heck do you even do this? How do you even picture this? Okay, 
So on the right side here, if you look at this photo on the right, you this is the entryway, and you will see the door on the left. That door goes to the photo on the left. So remember in, in hotels, when there's adjoining doors, you open one door to be faced with another door. Then mm -hmm. you have to open the door on that side. Uh, one of those doors will be eliminated in our design. We'll put it somewhere else. It's kind of the musical chair of doors in hotels. Um, the unit on the right will be the living room. So you will walk in, your bathroom is to the right. That will become the kitchen. Straight ahead, that unit on the right, that will be the living room. This door that you see on the left side will become the bedroom, the door to the bedroom. And here's how it looks. I wish my pointer was working, but, um, or rather could figure out how to do it, but my 10-year-old's in the other room, so you just have to bear with me. You walk in, um, <laughs> I'll use my fingers, but I don't think you guys could see that. Just you walk straight in, and what would have been a bathroom is now your kitchenette, and you have all the plumbing there, and you have your updated electrical that's required for your kitchenette. You turn to the left, we've eliminated one of those doors, so that door will go into the hallway, which is the hallway to enter the bathroom that goes all the way to the left. Okay. That door that we removed is now put on the bedroom door, so you have your own. Uh, door to your bedroom, and that's combining two units. Wow, okay. You're right. right. I couldn't have, I couldn't have visual, visualized that unless you did this. This is good because I'm like, okay, <laughs> how do you – but you are taking it from 100 units down to, what, 65? You have to, yeah, yeah. because they're too small. They're hotel rooms. Our sizes are uh, 369, so 300 – and some change square feet for the studios, 600 for the 600 square feet for the um, one bedrooms and the 900 for the two bedrooms. There's That's still good. a smidge on the smaller side. Um, we, uh, there's a, an army base here and a medical center that will be leaving a number of these furnished. So um, we think it will be just fine. It's real close to our comparable property in unit size. Here's a mock-up of what a studio would look like too. So you walk in the door, to the left is your bathroom, as almost always in hotels, it's either to the left or the right. In this case, it's to the left. On the other side of that bathroom, there's your kitchenette. We have used the plumbing from the bathroom for the kitchenette. 